Hi. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, and thank you so much to the Academy for Justice for holding this event. It's an honor to be here. This panel, this first panel is titled Strict Liability and Felony Murder, Principles, Policies, and Reform. And let me briefly introduce our panelists and commentators. Our panelists are first Professor Stephen Garvey, who's the A. Robert Knoll Professor of Law at Cornell Law School. And his paper is titled Versari Crimes. And uh, next, we have Professor Giora Binder, who's a SUNY Distinguished Professor, the Hodgson Russ Faculty Scholar, and the Vice Dean for Research and Faculty Development at the University of Buffalo School of Law. His video submission is on felony murder and police violence, which is a project that also is uh, co authored by conference panelist Eko Yenka a professor of law at Cardozo Law, whom we'll hear from later in the day. And our distinguished commentators are first, the Honorable Jed Rakoff, who is a senior judge in the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, and Laura Hankins, a former colleague of mine, who is general counsel for the Public Defender Service for the District of Columbia in Washington, DC. So, I'm going to start by giving an overview of and a brief, uh, brief commentary on the two papers, um, attempting to contextualize the topics and highlights and relevant themes and, and policy stakes. Obviously, the topic is incredibly timely as felony murder prosecutions are underway in three prominent cases in the news related to police killings, Ahmaud Arbery and Rayshard Brooks in Georgia and George Floyd in Minnesota. Perhaps it's also relevant at, in a less obvious way to the Breonna Taylor killing, which is in the news now where no officer has been charged with homicide um, and where in Kentucky, the common law felony murder rule has been abolished. So let me first describe and, and respond to the project of Professor Binder and his co-author, Professor Yenka. I see them making five claims. Um, normally I would stick to three, like trial lawyers do. Um, but there are five wonderful, compelling claims and I, I think they're all worth uh, setting, being set forth for those who, who didn't have a chance to see the video presentation. So first they argue that, and of course they'll tell me if, uh, if this is in any way inaccurate. First, Professor Binder explains that prosecuting police based on assaultive acts as the predicate felony for a felony murder prosecution, as prosecutors are doing in the Arbery, Brooks, and Floyd cases, actually stops the jury and the public from being able to fully hold officers morally responsible for the level of culpability that they have in the deaths of the victims. So instead, at best, they go down on an easily proven strict liability offense and avoid a full moral reckoning uh, as desired by the Black Lives Matter movement. Second, they argue that the resort to using assault as a predicate felony in these cases actually isn't necessary um, because they argue that all involve independent felonies like false imprisonment or violation of public trust. Third, they argue that the lack of a merger doctrine in states like Georgia and Minnesota and six others actually works against racial justice because it, it does too much work in felony murder prosecutions in general where defendants uh, do not tend to be police officers in the general run of cases. So for example, um, as Professor Binder explains, in Georgia, prosecutors are forced to charge assault-based felony murder in almost any homicide where intent to kill is hard to prove. And that's because it's the only game in town. Georgia doesn't have depraved heart murder and involuntary manslaughter is only a misdemeanor. So lots of defendants in Georgia who would be charged in another state with involuntary manslaughter or second degree depraved heart murder for an unintentional killing end up going down on felony murder. Fourth, they argue that proximate cause theory as compared to agency theory, which much more broadly holds felons and their accomplices liable for any foreseeable killings rather than simply killings by the uh, 
felons and their accomplices alone works against racial justice because it allows police to shift blame for police brutality onto suspects themselves. So Professor Binder goes into a lot of examples of what appear to be unjustified police shootings that are transformed into felony murder prosecutions of young unarmed black people, mostly kids, um, for the deaths of their friends in the examples he gives. The fifth and finally, and somewhat um, counterintuitively, they argue that the idealistic pursuit of eliminating the felony murder doctrine isn't going to work uh, or is not likely to work, especially where we now are relying on it to prosecute police. And instead, according to Professor Binder, reformers should focus on the sort of incremental reforms that he has advocated for um, in his scholarship over the years. So for example, a robust merger doctrine, eliminating proximate cause theory, eliminating aider and a better liability, eliminating unenumerated felony murder and the like. Because these reforms, uh, he argues, may make felony murder so convoluted and difficult that they may sound the death knell for the doctrine. So these arguments are compelling and, and I'm sold. So let's move to the next panel. No, um, I, I wanted to put two questions to Professor Binder um, that were raised for me from his presentation. And then I'll say I'm, I'm going to move on to Professor Garvey's paper, um, give my thoughts on both, and then allow the uh, panelists a chance to respond. With respect to Professor Binder and uh, Yenka's paper, uh, I had two lingering questions. One is, is whether the independent felonies you identify in these pending police killing cases are really so independent. So, you know, perhaps, perhaps false imprisonment in the Arbery case is the most independent. But in the Brooks case, where the predicate felony is violation of public trust, it seems like the shooting of Mr. Brooks in the back as he's running away is itself the alleged violation of the oath. And, and in the killing of Mr. Floyd, it, it seems like it's the assaultive act itself and the alleged racist motive behind it that might give rise to a hate crime enhancement or a civil rights offense. And it, it seems that those attendant circumstances um, or those ad additional aspects of the killing uh, that, that are, are, make the killing more morally culpable when it's a violation of public trust or racially motivated, but it's not clear to me that they make them more dangerous in the sense of increasing the chance of death during the course of the felony. And so I wonder if it, 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 it doesn't really advance the ball to use those things that are simply making the assault of act more morally culpable um, as the predicate felony. It still feels like it's imposing felony murder liability on something that would normally be a lower grade of homicide, um, uh, notwithstanding the, the higher moral culpability for the assault. Uh, all right, so I'm wondering whether those who support these prosecutions and the lack of a merger doctrine have a, have a point here, that assaultive acts that lead to death should be treated as first degree murder and no lesser grade of homicide will do because there's no other way to get to these through independent felonies. And second, I wanna, push back on the strategic suggestion that instead of seeking to abolish felony murder, reformers should continue to, we might say, tinker with the machinery of felony murder. And I'm thinking of California, where I think 70% of those on death row have a felony murder conviction, and where even with recent reforms, people who cause a death during an enumerated predicate felony are still held strictly liable for those deaths, and major participants acting with extreme recklessness are still held liable for first, first degree murder. So I'm gonna next briefly turn to Professor Garvey's engaging article on Versari crimes, which before a few days ago, I have to admit, I did not know was a thing. Um, so Professor Garvey explains that a number of doctrines we've come to know, like felony murder, that impose strict liability for some element, can actually be traced to something that he calls the Versari principle. So apparently a Dominican friar in the 13th century who eventually became a saint, not on this basis alone, I don't believe, Raymond of Penyafort, wrote in a guide for professors that versari, et cetera, et cetera, a long Latin phrase that means 
one who traffics in the illicit is responsible for all wrongs consequences that ensue. So if you do something illegal, you're strictly liable for the consequences. In turn, as he explains, Raymond's guide was relied upon by English treatise writers, and in turn to Coke, to Hale, to Blackstone, and eventually to Rakoff, or to American judges. And thus we have uh, felony murder, the lesser crime principle, natural and probable consequences doctrine, transferred intent, etc. Garvey then goes on to analyze whether this principle can be justified under traditional purposes of punishment. He concludes that it can't be justified on retributive grounds because it extends liability past moral culpability. He argues it might be justified theoretically on deterrence grounds, but that this would be an obvious pretext because it would be such an inefficient and, and grossly disproportionate means of achieving deterrence. And he concludes that the principle is best explained by vengeance. Uh, although he says he can understand why many would find this justification distasteful. And in the end, he acknowledges the case for the Versari principle may be an uneasy one and notes that even saints are human. So I also found Professor Garvey's analysis very compelling and I have two brief follow-up questions for him. So first, I wonder if you think there's a difference between strict liability for results, which we see in felony murder, as compared to strict liability for attendant circumstances, which we see in the lesser crime principle. And the reason I ask is that many 1L law students learn that even though the lesser crime and the, the moral wrong principles are well established at common law, it was also well established that crimes like malicious endangerment required proof not merely of a wicked act, but of recklessness towards the, the resulting risk to others. And a representative case in the, in the Kadish, now Barkow, Casebook is Regina versus Cunningham, where the court reversed the conviction of a man who pulled a gas meter off the wall to get the eight shillings inside and inadvertently ended up releasing noxious gas and endangering neighbors. And the jury instruction saying that as long as he committed a wicked act, he was guilty, um, uh, were deemed erroneous and the conviction was reversed. So second, I wonder what your theory is on how the model penal code drafters back in 1962 approached these issues. They, the model penal code, as, as, as you note in the paper, rejects, squarely rejects the lesser crime principle and the natural and co probable consequences doctrine. They also seem to reject the concept of vengeance in the context of, for example, um, proximate causation, their version of proximate cause, and also the fact that they uh, would punish many attempts at the exact same level as the completed crime, so that the, the resulting uh, harm isn't what is doing most of the work in punishment, and that it's largely mens rea that's doing the work. Um, but they include a modified version of felony murder. And they also impose strict liability for age in sexual assault cases where the victim is under 10. There's no mistake of fact defense, which they say explicitly. So I'm wondering whether you think those two outliers are simply a, a sop to the masses by the model penal code drafters, or whether you think the drafters were sincerely following some more modest version of the Versari principle. And if so, is that something we should do as well? So uh, let me stop there and see if our panelists, um, maybe starting with, um, well, actually, I'll let you all decide, but um, uh, respond for a few moments, see if there's anything else that you'd like to add before we hear from our commentators. Anyone want to start? You can go ahead. Okay, uh, Professor Binder, yeah. Sure. Um, uh... I'm happy to, if that's, um, Andrea, what, what you're suggesting now? Um, it's e either one, but um, okay. if I'm flipping a coin, I'll just say Professor Okay, okay. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, so um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, those are both for, you know, the, the, um, the sympathetic portrayal and, and, um, of, uh, of our aims and, uh, and the penetrating questions. So, um, uh, so let me um, uh, uh, make a couple of 
sort of uh, uh, clarifying points here. So, um, uh, so first of all, on the question of the availability of independent felonies. So, um, I think yes, there there are independent felonies available in Georgia. Um, so, in in the um, uh, in the Arbery case, uh, you know. Um, uh, that's that's been uh, charged the the, uh, um, the false imprisonment uh, uh, one. Um, uh, they're they're also uh, available in the Brooks case, and that's the um, uh, uh, the, the, the official uh, misconduct felony. Um, there as for the uh, the Floyd case, so so yeah the the, the one um, uh, a possible. Uh, uh, um, uh, underlying felony uh, that, that's an alternative to assault and battery would be a hate crime, which is really an aggravated assault, a hate aggravated um, uh, assault. Um, but for reasons uh, pointed out in uh, uh, um, my co author, Professor Yanka's paper, uh, um, that's difficult to prove. You know the the, uh, the requisite level of, of 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 mens rea for a hate crime is uh, um, uh, is difficult to prove, and so I don't I don't know that it's a that it's a particularly practical solution uh, for the the Derek Chauvin uh, prosecution. Um, uh, but um, on, on the other hand, there is available in in Minnesota a depraved indifference murder um, offense, which um, has a a lower penalty, it's third degree murder instead of second degree murder, so it has a, has a lower penalty than the felony murder charge that, um, that Chauvin's been charged with, but it actually better describes um, what's morally reprehensible about um, uh, Chauvin's conduct. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's much worse than just an aggravated assault, right? It, it was indeed, or, you know, um, uh, um, you know, uh, reckless and arguably in a depraved way. So, um, with with that clarification in mind, now your question is: um, uh, Are these um, uh, independent felonies really independent? And um, so, that question kind of breaks down into in, into two different ones. I, I'm going to you know offer two different interpretations of your question, both of which I think I heard uh, some support for in, in the way you framed it. So one is, um, do these um, independent felonies or, or uh, allegedly independent felonies add danger to the, um, uh, to, to the, uh, the underlying, to, to the, uh, um, uh, the act causing death? And, um, that um, that's actually uh, I, I think um, not what an independent felony is supposed to be adding. So, um, uh, at least on my account of what makes felony murder plausible, um, uh, is that it involves two different types of culpability: a uh, a, um, a measure of culpability towards death. Um, I think when we actually look at the way felony murder uh, rules operate in most jurisdictions, they're effectively negligence rules, not strict liability, so they involve some culpability towards death, um, not as much as we might like, but they do involve some. Um, but they also involve something else, uh, uh, which is um, uh, uh, a, uh, um, a, a reprehensible purpose for imposing the excessive risk of death. And that's what, um, uh, at, at least in the minds of, I think, um, many in the public, um, aggravates uh, uh, dangerous conduct into something potentially much worse. It's the sort of selfish or, uh, or, or depraved purpose for imposing an unjustifiable risk on others. So um, I think we see that uh, in, in the um, uh, in the Arbery case with the, the sort of um, uh, racially motivated um, 
you know, pursuit and hunting down um, of Arbery, the, the sort of false assertion of governing authority. Um, uh, that, and, uh, and, you know, um, so if we, if we see the, um, uh, the killing of George Floyd as racially motivated, I think we, th then um, uh, uh, we, we have a, a, a similar uh, sort of problem. Similarly, if, if we see the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the Floyd killing and the Brooks killing as reflecting a kind of false assertion of authority and privilege on the part of police to be um, obeyed absolutely, to not have um, uh, uh, suspects or, or defendants um, assert their, uh, uh, their rights or question police authority, to um, uh, treat the sort of slightest sense of risk to their own personal safety as, um, uh, you know, as a justification to empty their weapons uh, on, uh, uh, you know, so um, so yeah, I think that there's um, another dimension of moral wrong here, and that to the extent that felony murder is justifiable at all, it requires both of those dimensions. It's not just um, uh, a punishment for imposing danger; it's punishment for imposing danger um, fatally for a very bad reason. Um, uh, okay, so. Um, uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, 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 all right. Uh, let, let me let me um, uh, address the, the the other um, major question that um, uh, that you asked here, which is about um, what's our best reform strategy. Um, and here I want to clarify: I'm not opposed to abolition of felony murder. Um, I am confident that. Um, uh, that my fellow scholars will continue to um, dismiss felony murder as utterly irrational um, in their criminal law classes, in their articles, um, in writing amicus briefs. Um, uh, scholars have been doing that since the English Criminal Law Commission in, you know, in 1830. They will continue to do that. Um, it hasn't worked thus far. Maybe it will work. Um, I think that there's, um, uh, there's room for an incremental reform strategy also. I also think that um, if scholars uh, um, sort of recognize the value of the incremental reform strategy, they may pursue abolition in a more responsible way. Because I actually think that some abolition advocacy has been counterproductive. When we teach our students that um, felony murder is utterly irrational, that its only function, it, 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 that the, the only rationale for it is, um, is sort of a, um, a go to jail free card for the prosecution, well, those students grow up and become prosecutors and judges. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we, we see judicial decisions that, that uh, um, as ascribe a similar legislative purpose to felony murder rules, that those judges do not have the power to, um, uh, to abolish or overturn. Thanks so much. Um, Professor Garvey, any additional thoughts you want to offer before we move to our commentators? Uh, so you had two questions. You want me to answer those? You'd like, yeah. That'd be good. So the first question was, uh, do I see any difference between strict liability with respect to results, strict liability with respect to attendant circumstances, the first being reflected in the felony murder rule, traditionally understood, uh, the second being reflected in the legal wrong doctrine, uh, and the answer is no, I don't see any difference, uh, at least in terms of this, the application of this Versari idea. You mentioned the Cunningham case, uh, which Josh Dressler and I also uh, use. Um, now, the way I teach that case is typically it shows the transition from uh, broad sense of mens rea to the elemental sense of mens rea. And I, so, so I use it for that purpose. And I think it can be used for that purpose. But I also think 
um, there's a different way to understand what's going on in that case. Uh, and that would be while they retain the sense of, that the appellate court retains the sense of broad mens rea, uh, insofar as Cunningham crossed the line, so to speak, when he you know, stole from the, you know, he took the, 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 the gas meter off the wall, uh, but then they reject the Versari principle. That is to say, they sort of supplement it uh, with uh, some retributive idea that you have to have uh, some kind of culpable mental state um, with respect to each uh, element of the offense. Um, second question was about you know, the model penal code. Um, so I think that many of the provisions of the model penal code are consistent with um, retributive notions of having some mental state apply to each and every uh, uh, material element of the offense that's sort of expressed in um, uh, 202. Um, you asked specifically about, you know, well, they have some sort of, you know, modified felony murder rule, you know, with a presumption of extreme indifference. That's true. And they uh, uh, contemplate strict liability uh, when the age threshold for statutory rape is particularly low. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't have any sense about, you know, what the, what the drafters had in mind. Um, with respect to the age limitation piece of it, um, but with respect to the felony murder, my long understanding has been that that was a concession to the political reality and the fact that the felony murder rule had been long entrenched. Because they were trying to get this code adapted, adopted out there, so it couldn't depart too far from that. Got it. Um, well, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to move on to our commentators and hear their thoughts on the papers. We're gonna start with Judge Rakoff and then um, uh, move to Laura Hankins. And uh, so we'll do that for 10 minutes or so. And, um, and then we're gonna take a break at 9.55. Uh, Judge? So uh, th uh, thank you very much, Andrea. I, uh, uh, like most judges, I'm somewhat intimidated to be part of a conference with law professors because as the statistics show, the people uh, who are really the smart people in um, uh, law school are the ones who become law professors and it's us lower down who become judges. Uh, on the other hand, I take some solace in the uh, old joke that uh, a judge is a law professor who marks his own papers. Um, so, uh, I'm very glad to be here. I do have to make one disclaimer, which is that uh, under federal law, I am forbidden from commenting on any pending case, um, not just before me, but before any judge. And that includes the cases that you were uh, discussing at the outset. So uh, that is uh, off the table for me. But looking more broadly, and, and looking in particular at the very excellent points raised uh, by Professor Garby and Professor Binder in their papers, um, you know, felony murder has been around for centuries, and it's been criticized for centuries, and yet it has survived. Uh, and the question is, why has it survived? Um, uh, some rationalizations have been given for it, like super deterrence, uh, like retribution. I think uh, Professor Garvey does a, a really splendid job of showing that those don't work. Um, the uh, Professor Binder points out that consequences are important to in throughout the criminal justice system. We give a higher penalty for murder than we do for attempted murder. Uh, but again, those all involve intent. Um, and here you have uh, a strict liability uh, offense. So what's the justification? Um, I think the everyday person would say that, gee, if someone goes about breaking the law and uh, causes the death of a person, they ought to pay the price. A very broad but simple kind of, they might view it in Professor Binder's words in one of his articles as a moral intuition. Uh, they might view it in uh, Professor Garvey's words as vengeance, uh, but it's a 
strongly felt emotional feeling. And because death is involved, the strength of the emotion is high. Um, and therefore, I think it cannot be uh, easily uh, overlooked. But I think there's a second reason that uh, I didn't see mentioned uh, in the articles why felony murder survives today, despite so much academic criticism. And that is that it's very strongly supported by the police and prosecutors, uh, who are obviously powerful uh, agents in our society. Um, the, uh, as uh, I'm sure most of you know, the overwhelming majority of criminal cases are plea bargained. Uh, and felony murder gives the prosecutor a huge weapon that he or she doesn't have to get the kind of plea that they like to, plea bargain that they like to see happen. Um, and and uh, I think um, it's also uh, in certain kinds of cases, a tool uh, for obtaining cooperation. Um, uh, if someone in a complicated crime is relatively low level, uh, but you can nevertheless say you're automatically uh, subject to felony murder, uh, that gives them a tremendous motive to want to cooperate. So I think there are those practical aspects that also play into why felony murder continues uh, to exist. Um, the, I thought it was very interesting in the papers uh, to see uh, the discussion about strict liability versus negligence, uh, neither of which, of course, is the norm for the criminal justice system, which mostly deals with mens rea, as was pointed out at the outset. Uh, but there is a difference. We, we uh, I think, see the difference between negligent homicide and strict liability homicide. Uh, and strict liability is a very, uh, very exceptional uh, situation in our criminal justice system. Um, it's usually justified as including drug laws on grounds of super deterrence, which don't really seem to apply uh, in the felony murder kind of context. Um, so I had a case uh, a year ago that raised all this. Um, and it was United States versus Giamfi, G-Y-A-M-F-I. Uh, and I know you will want to write down, it's reported at 357 F sub third, 355 Southern District of New York, <coughs> 2019. And it, it, here were the facts of that case. Uh, Mr. Gianfi was an aider and a better of an armed robber. He was not a co-conspirator, he didn't plan the robbery, but he was hired by the robbers to be a lookout man. And so he, the, the robbers were going to rob a stash house belonging to some drug dealers uh, where they knew a lot of cash and valuable drugs were kept. Uh, and his job was simply to wait outside and make sure no one came by that might interrupt the robbery. Um, he knew that the, one of the robbers had a gun. Um, the, uh, the robbery took place, the uh, drug dealers in the stash house resisted, uh, and ultimately one of the robbers, the one who had a gun, shot and killed uh, one of the uh, people in the stash house. Um, Mr. Gianfi was then charged not only with being an aider and better of an armed robbery, but with felony murder. And the government said that their view of the federal law is that it's a strict liability crime. Um, and that uh, uh, I should instruct the jury, this was of course a jury trial, uh, that uh, if he was convicted of uh, uh, aiding and abetting the armed robbery, then he was automatically guilty of the felony murder count. Um, the defense said, no, we think there should be a foreseeability aspect uh, added under federal law. Um, 
that he had to foresee that there was a meaningful risk that a murder might occur uh, when he joined, uh, when he agreed to be uh, the lookout man. Um, and I went with the defense and that's what my little opinion is about. Um, uh, but I think it does illustrate that um, the, the difference between felony murder as a strict liability crime and felony murder as a negligence crime is not uh, unimportant in the real uh, application of these cases. So um, I will end by saying uh, that uh, like many people here, I think felony murder should be abolished. Uh, and like many people here, I'm not very optimistic that's going to occur. Thank you, Judge. Um, so uh, Laura Hankins is next. And we I know we only have seven minutes until the end of this session, but we'll have time when we come back um, to continue the discussion as well. So um, uh, Laura, if you want to get in the seven minutes of commentary now, and then we'll we'll go from there. Um, thank you. Um, thank you. And hello, everyone. Um, I, I actually didn't realize that the people charged with the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Rayshard Brooks were charged with felony murders. I'll confess that I don't read too closely stories about police killings and killings that are basically lynchings. As a public defender, I'm always torn. I don't cheer when anyone is charged with murder. The power of the state is mighty, and it is a scary thing when it is turned against an individual, any individual. But I'm also disappointed and sad when the prosecution does not charge a person, when that person is suspected of killing a black person with racist intent. Then I'm sad not because the person was not charged, I'm sad because my community thinks that holding an individual criminally liable for a harm done to one of our own is what justice is that a criminal charge would be our proof that we matter in this country. So when a prosecutor or grand jury determines that a killing of a black person is justified or excused, when no individual will be held criminally responsible for that death, it feels like the state and the larger community is saying again, that our deaths are not a loss, not a loss that counts. So my real sadness is that our society relies on the criminal legal system to tell us our worth and too often the criminal legal system tells my community that we are not worthy. So felony murder, police violence, and the moral and philosophical underpinnings of the sorry crimes. When I finished viewing Professor Binder's presentation, I immediately thought of the Audre Lord quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. During the only two years of my legal career, when I was not at the DC Public Defender Service, years in the wilderness, as it were, I worked for a civil rights organization. Those years coincided with a push by civil rights groups for expanding federal hate crime statutes. And I remember sitting in coalition meetings and thinking what a mistake we were making. It was like we had forgotten who is in the criminal justice system, who the system gets used against most often. And that's my feeling about felony murder as well. To be clear, I've never heard anyone argue that the reason we should keep felony murder uh, uh, on the statute books is so we can charge apparently racist police and racist killers. But then I don't get out much. But just in case someone is arguing that, my response is that felony murder is a terrible crime. It's wildly unfair that it's what we offer as a way of addressing the problem of racially motivated police and vigilante killings doesn't make it worth saving. The community that is most often the literal victim of the criminal justice system should not look to that system to save us ever. The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. So then has the moment arrived, as Professor Binder asks, for us to take the glamorous approach of arguing that felony murder is morally and rationally indefensible and ought to be eliminated? Or should we continue, or in some places begin, his unglamorous approach of incrementally reforming felony murder into practical oblivion? The answer to both is yes. This is the moment. Argue big and then achieve what's possible. It strikes me that 
one place to start our crusade is to tell people that felony murder is a classic example of the Vasari principle. For me, um, for, for one, Vasari sounds foreign, uh, and so it ought to be rejected as un-American. And two, we don't put much stock in principles these days, so we've practically won the whole argument right there. But as someone who works on criminal code reform in the District of Columbia, and who will work hard to see that the recommendations of the Criminal Code Reform Commission pass the DC Council and ultimately become law, I found the questions posed by Professor Garvey's article incredibly helpful. For all that courts try to divine legislative intent based on my experience, it wouldn't surprise me to learn that most modern Versari crimes were created not because of a theory of retribution, deterrence, vengeance, or some combination of the foregoing, but rather because of poor drafting. And that's a good thing. Because if we use the Vasari principle to surface crimes that have strict liability elements, circumstance or result elements, then we can ask why. Why is that good policy? What is the purpose? What makes it just to punish someone more harshly for a circumstance or result for which they had no mens rea, no culpability? And once we've broken open the conversation, we can ask retribution, well, that weighs against felony murder. Deterrence doesn't work. Vengeance, well, that's an embarrassing, antiquated notion. I suspect it's accidentally poor drafting or it's problems of proof. But by examining felony murder and similar crimes, we can hopefully finally have the conversation where we recognize that we are offering up individual punishment as the response to harm, as if punishing an individual will fix what's wrong, and as if the number of years we lock someone away in a cage is a valid measure of the worth of the person or the community that was harmed. But if we eliminate felony murder, then we are acknowledging that at least some harm will not be ameliorated by the criminal justice system. The victim will not be made whole because someone went to prison. When we acknowledge that the criminal legal system is not the entire answer and the sole source of justice, we might, as a community, work on other ways to ameliorate harm, or even better, do more to prevent harm in the first place. And then we could eliminate felony murder and reduce police violence too. Thank you, Laura. Um, and thank you, Judge Rakoff, um, for those thoughts and those comments. Um, a lot to think about. We're going to take a five minute screen break and come back at 10 a.m. And um, I'll have some questions for our commentators and we'll also give the panelists a chance to respond to what they just heard if they'd like. And then we'll take some questions and sort of open it up for a more free form discussion from there. Um, so thanks and uh, see you back at 10 o'clock. So oh, hi everyone, welcome back. We are still on panel one, which is about strip liability and felony murder principles, policies, and reform. So we've had a chance to hear an overview of questions raised by Professor Binder and Professor Garvey's presentations and papers. And we've heard some comments from Judge Rakoff and Laura Hankins um, from the point of view of a judge and a general counsel and practitioner, um, I wanted to give, uh, I, I have some specific questions for our, our commentators who more than others see how this is working on the ground. Um, but first I wanted to give Professor Binder or Professor Garvey a chance uh, to respond if they'd like uh, to anything that came up in their minds from the comments of Judge Rakoff and, uh, and Ms. Hankins. Um, sure, I'll just take a, a minute. Um, uh, I think you've turned my camera off. Yeah, let's see. Oh. Um, I don't think I have any. Okay, there, there we go. Hour yep. that I know of. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, uh, um, I, I appreciate um, uh, both uh, both comments. Um, uh, I uh, I certainly you know 
hope that this is a uh, a moment where um, uh, where more ambitious um, change is uh, is possible. Um, I guess on the you know abolition versus reform uh, uh, question, um, you know it. Uh, the, the reality is is that um, uh, in most jurisdictions, abolition is going to have to come legislatively, um, uh, because the uh, um, the felony murder rule is statutory. Um, uh, Massachusetts, which uh, abolished it um, judicially, uh, is an outlier because they uh, um, th they considered their uh, their rule to be um, to be a common law rule that had been read into uh, their uh, um, their statute by the court, so the court could unread it. Um, uh, but uh, uh, you know, so in the you know in the meantime, um, uh, th there remain um, 41 felony um, you know, felony murder states plus you know the, the, the federal system and in DC and you know. Lawyers operating in those systems and and uh, um, courts administering them, and so you know uh, the the arguments about how those laws should best be interpreted while they you know while they remain in force, um, uh, you know, uh, that re remain. Um, on the death penalty point that um, uh, that 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 you made. Um, uh, so, so yeah, um, uh, I've, um, uh, I've, I've published on the question of, um, felony murder based, uh, capital punishment and argued that, uh, that Edmund and Tyson should be seen as, as applying to actual killers, uh, as, as well as to, um, uh, as well as to, uh, um, uh, alleged accomplices um, and argue that in fact there's, uh, you know, should be seen to be an evolving standard of decency uh, that, that would support that. Um, and uh, um, uh, as, as for the, the, the Giampi case, um, uh, you know, I've, I've corresponded with Judge Rakoff about that and, um, you know, uh, con congratulated uh, uh, him on, uh, um, uh, on the analysis. Accomplice liability in felony murder and the existence of felony murder liability for, for actual, um, you know, causers of death. Those are two separate questions analytically and they should be seen as such. Uh, so I, I guess the only uh, comment I have is that, you know, insofar as this is a conference about reforming uh, statutes that uh, provide for strict liability. And I think a lot of the doctrines that Michael identified in the initial material he sent to us are in some sense another strict liability. If you, you know, if the goal is to reform those and, and the way I would put it, make them tend more in a retributive direction so that um, you achieve proportionality um, I don't think reformers want to underestimate the intuition to which Judge Rakoff referred um, that that seems to support any of these doctrines. Okay, there's um, we have some some great questions from the gallery. Um, I might ask a brief question of our commentators first before we get to those questions from the gallery. Um, and, and one question for Judge Rakoff is, um, I mean, I guess the broad version of it is, do you have, I mean, you talked about some of the things that you've seen with respect to plea bargaining and the particular case from last year. Do you have any specific lessons for reformers based on what you've seen in federal court? And, uh, and if, you know, is there something unique about what you are seeing in the federal system where there is Pinkerton liability and RICO and, you know, some of the other tools that exist, um, in the, the way that felony murder is used in the federal system that might uh, be different or might offer lessons for, for what's going on in the states 
Um, so anything that you're seeing on the ground that you, that you think could translate into advice for reformers one way or the other, which battles to pick or um, something that they should be fighting that they may not be fully aware of? Well, that's a tough question because um, the, uh, the cases that uh, are criminal cases in the federal courts tend to be on the whole the bigger cases, either more defendants or involving uh, uh, cross country or international drug deals or whatever. Um, and there the penalties uh, are high to begin with, but those cases almost always require a cooperator. And therefore, you, you don't see the felony murder charge so often in the final part of the case. Uh, it's being used in the prosecutor's office as one of the weapons to get cooperation. Now, it's also used for plea bargains for the others, but uh, the, uh, and the result is that the prosecutor has a huge power in the federal system. That's true in many state systems as well. But the, just the, the sheer size of the penalties is what gives prosecutors what, in my view, is inordinate power. And, um, uh, and that is a function of many things, but felony murder is part of that mix. Thanks. Um, Laura, I suppose my specific question to you before we move on to some of the questions from the gallery is, um, you know, you've had a front row seat to legislative reform efforts, jury instruction reform <laughs> efforts over the years. And um, because you were involved in, in uh, legislative advocacy before becoming general counsel, if I recall. So um, I'm wondering if you have any insights from what you've seen on the ground in, in Washington, D.C. about the resistance um, of, of, of otherwise um, progressive uh, counsel, for example, to eliminating the felony murder doctrine and whether you think it's in part because they have these moral intuitions that just won't go away, sort of what um, Professor Garvey was referring to, or whether it's largely a concern about proof problems, like we won't be able to get them on depraved tar murder or, or premeditated murder, so this is the only tool in our arsenal, or whether it's because they want to encourage, um, you know, give prosecutors more leverage in plea bargaining to get to the crimes um, that we really think are, um, are the appropriate reflection of uh, culpability, sort of what, what the judge was just talking about. Any, any insights in, in terms of what you've seen on the ground? No. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we haven't had the conversation in, in DC yet, not, not about felony murder specifically. So, so on, the, uh, on the worrisome side it is is an example of a conversation we did have a fight that I lost um, uh, which was um, had to do with distribution of liquid PCP um, uh, which possession of controlled substances at the time was all was punished as a misdemeanor um, 180 days, regardless of the type of the controlled substance, um, and distribution is a 30-year offense. Um, uh, and and essentially, the prosecution would charge distribution for 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 possession of of a small amount of liquid PCP and distribution under possession with intent to distribute um, um, under the theory that that the person possessed it to allow dippers, and that was the distribution of the PCP. Um, and they went to the council and said, we need to change this. Um, basically, we cannot convince the jury that this is possession with intent to distribute. They keep just finding it's possession. Um, and so how about if we just possess, uh, punish possession 
more harshly and make it a, a five-year offense um, instead of uh, a simple misdemeanor, purely because we can't convince the, the, the juries um, otherwise. Uh, and the council was like, PCP, that's bad. Okay, yeah, let's do that. Um, so that's unfortunate and a bad example. Um, but, but that was some years ago and I, and, I, and I was absolutely, I mean, so I have a couple of thoughts super, super briefly ab about the possibility in, in DC and this moment. One, we have a criminal code reform commission that is sort of like revising or reforming our entire criminal code. And so when, when the conversation is before the council, it's going to be about our entire criminal code and mental states with respect to, and, and lots of other sort of changes with respect to a number of offenses. Um, so, so to the extent felony murder might get talked about specifically, at least will be in a context of um, focusing on the importance of mental states and, and mens rea generally. That actually makes me optimistic. And I was absolutely serious when I sort of said, I, I found um, uh, Professor Garvey's article really helpful in, in thinking about how the conversation could go. I don't think of reform as arguing to judges. That isn't what I do. Um, um, I do think of it as arguing to the DC Council, which is like 13 people who were kind of like my neighbors. And how would I talk about this with them in a in a very real, in a very real way? And I do think it's a hard conversation, right? Like felony murder, somebody died, and someone ought to pay for that. But I think it's helpful to talk about, okay, but why? Why does this person have to pay? They're paying for something. They're paying for the robbery, the armed robbery, the whatever. Why do they have to pay for this? And what's the larger story of this crime and what brought this person to this moment? What do we own about what happened here that maybe we need to pay for as a community and thinking about how we address the larger harm? So I'm optimistic, <laughs> foolishly, perhaps. Yeah. I'm not used to hearing that you're optimistic. Or, or so. foolish. Not when you're, you're right, like, right. Right. So, you um, so that last point of, of Laura's about, um, you know, questioning, uh, you know, whether this person needs to pay um, sort of is a, is a segue to one of the questions we have from the gallery from Ken Simons. Um, he says, I have a question for Professor Binder and Professor Garvey about whether retributive principles can justify a, a weak version of the felony murder rule based on the idea that the whole committing a felony, creating a foreseeable risk of death is, is greater than the, the sum of the parts. Um, and we've heard this argument um, in the, the literature, um, but I don't know if, if you all have addressed it today and, and, and what your thoughts are on on that, the viability of it. Um, Professor Binder, thoughts? Sure. Um, so, uh, um, not not surprisingly, um, uh, you know, Ken, who has written extensively about this this question of um, both uh, uh, strict liability and and, and negligence, um, would would put his finger on um, you know the, the sort of the, the sore spot as it were. Um, so um, from my point of view, yeah, I think there's a there is a difference between um, the the sort of straight for sorry principle, which would be um, uh, a, a kind of um, uh, transfer of culpability from one wrong to another, um, you know, um, uh, uh, where basically we have strict liability with respect to one injury, um, but, but the, you know, um, the suspect is, is, is held liable for it because of their, um, their culpability with respect to another injury. I think there's a difference between that and a compound culpability, where um, an offender has some culpability with respect to one injury and, um, and then a culpability of purpose 
with respect to another injury so that they are imposing uh, a, a risk on someone in order to achieve um, a, uh, um, you know, a, another nefarious purpose. I'm not sure that's the, that's the same as the Versari principle. I think that, um, th that uh, academic, you know, that scholarly critics of felony murder have, um, you know, sort of made their jobs too easy by um, by characterizing um, felony murder liability as um, you know simpler than it is in practice, um, and so you know um, uh, for, for for me you know the the uh, um, the issue is okay what about you know what about compound um, uh, um, uh, culpability is that as vulnerable maybe it is maybe it's you know on uh, maybe Steve's response will be, yeah, that's that's just the same thing as as, as the Versari principle. Great. I think the argument um, will be stronger if it's applied in that way to um, negligence plus uh, a uh, um, an independent wrongful purpose. I think that you know that that will that will have more more scope, more power. Um, uh, you know, another, um, you know, another sort of issue here is um, some formulations of the Versari principle historically um, limited it to wrongs of equal weight, wrongs of equal gravity. You know, does the, is the Versari principle as vulnerable if it's, um, if, if it has that sort of a proportionality limit? So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Steve. <laughs> Uh, so Kent's question is, uh, can retributive principles justify a weak version of the felony murder rule based on the idea that the whole committing a felony and creating a foreseeable risk of death is greater than the sum of its parts? So the answer is yes. And read Ken's article. Uh, he won't give you it, but I will. Uh, is strict liability in grading of offenses consistent with retributive desert? He says yes, under certain circumstances. Uh, rather than me try to reproduce what he says, I couldn't do it. Uh, you should read the article, 32, Oxford Journal of Legal Studies, 445, 2012. All right, so uh, Ken, you are the answer to your own question, so thank you. <laughs> um, uh, we also have a question from um, Gideon Yaffe, and I, I should have said this to Ken. Um, if you want to turn your camera on and ask the question um, yourself, that would be lovely. Um, otherwise, I'm very happy to. Uh, I mean, if, if you don't mind my just giving a very concrete example so people know what, what, what the argument is, but then I'll, then I'll shut up. Is, is that okay if I just. Um, oh, yes, of course. Of briefly, course. Uh, I mean, the kind of comparison I'm thinking of is if a defendant commits a bank robbery while carrying a gun and the gun accidentally falls to the, the, on the ground and ends up killing someone, many jurisdictions would say that's felony murder. Well, contrast that with a defendant who on a Monday walks into a gun with no criminal, per walk walks into a building with a gun with no criminal purpose, it falls, the gun falls to the ground, accidentally kills someone, at most negligent homicide. Uh, on Tuesday, the same defendant robs a bank without using a gun, causes no physical harm to anyone. What pun the punishment for the negligent homicide and for the bank robbery uh, together, uh, um, I, I think you could, you could make a good argument that if you have the joint purpose of committing a bank robbery and of using a gun if necessary while committing it, that makes you significantly more culpable than if you do those two separate acts of negligently killing a person with no felonious purpose, or if you do the separate act of committing a bank robbery without using a deadly weapon. So I think that intuition is behind us, the felony murder doctrine, and uh, Giora Binder has, I think, done a good job of explaining why maybe we academics should take it somewhat more seriously and support weaker versions of it, 
but then also critique the disproportionate way it's actually applied in the world today. Any other additional thoughts on that or what the best, is, is there a, a best version of the argument against that weaker version of, of felony murder or is the, is it clear that it would be morally justified based on this concept of whole is greater than the sum? Well, I think the, the basic idea is that you, you look at the facts of a particular case and if they add up to, you know, a certain level of culpability, and if the punishment is proportionate to that culpability, then there's no violation of retributive principles. And one question, sort of, this may be just an academic, we're at the academics, but you know, I, I, I haven't read uh, your work or Ken's work as closely as I should, but I, I, I'm, uh, one question I would have is, are you saying the same thing? That is to say, you look at the motive for the underlying felony, and if that's particularly culpable, then it may warrant um, you know, a greater, uh, greater liability. Iora, are you saying the same thing as Ken? I think you're muted. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Okay. So, um, uh, I think Ken and I actually agree on sort of what the issue is in um, uh, in, in retributive theory, um, and that it's you know the, that sort of the uh, the two wrongs are not just additive. I'm one of I you know not that it's not that I think it would be like a moral catastrophe if we would just sort of um, uh, you know if, if, if say um, uh, uh, someone who killed recklessly in, during a bank robbery were liable for manslaughter and liable for the bank robbery. I think that would be fine. That's what, you know, that's what lots of legal systems do. Um, although actually a lot of legal systems punish reckless killing as, as murder. We generally don't. Um, uh, um, you know, we also have a doctrine though of, um, depraved indifference murder, which is additive, right? So it, it basically, at least in, in some formulations, California, for example, recklessness plus an antisocial purpose, not a felonious purpose, not a terribly depraved purpose, just an antisocial purpose, um, that's depraved indifference murder, right? So um, uh, there are a lot of features like this in, um, uh, in, in our law. I mean, similarly, um, you know, robbery itself is a compound crime you know, an assault and a theft, we put them together and whoa, the liability is way bigger, right? So this is all, this runs all the way through our, our criminal justice system. If all of that is an example of the Versari principle, um, you know, that violates the Versari principle, then, uh, you know, I think there's sort of um, more work to be done in, in, you know, vindicating the moral intuition behind that critique. Um, if it's not, you know, then we sort of need to identify the ways in which, um, you know, uh, felony murder is currently, you know, sort of defined um, exceeds the, you know, the, the sort of um, uh, proper proportion of punishment. Laura? Yeah, I don't, I I feel like everyone has some particular system or, or law in mind, right? So the example, as I heard it, was a negligent homicide in, or, or, or yeah, negligence in, in both cases. And so during the break, because I thought, oh, I really actually need to sort of check the jury instructions for DC and, and and whether felony murder is really sort of strict liability or more like negligence. And, you know, for us, it's an enumerated felony um, or, or, or purposeful killing for an unenumerated felony, but it's, it's first degree. It's like premeditated, deliberated murder. It's not, it's not second degree or something else. So I do think, um, I think it matters 
then this is the problem with it. It always matters the story you're telling and what it fits into. So does retribution count? I don't know, maybe, but does it take you all the way to like life imprisonment and you're never getting out? No, no, that's just wrong. Whether the bank robbery happened on the Tuesday or the Monday or the, it's just wrong. But is it maybe a little bit more? I don't know, maybe I could live with that and that's morally okay, but I sort of feel like the, that we're talking, answering the questions with our own set of what, of, of laws, what the statutes look like in mind and what, and what the result ends up being. And I, and I think, I, I think if it is first degree murder and it is a lifetime in prison, that that is not something that should be put on the individual, that I don't think retribution sort of justifies that, that is an unequal punishment. So I just sort of felt like the conversation then mattered all of a sudden very much for what people were picturing the example in their minds, what that story was. And I went up, I, I, I'm telling a different story in my mind and I'm, I'm still offended by felony murder. <laughs> um, so Laura's question, or, or I take Laura's point to be, why do we have to go all the way to something that's equivalent to first degree premeditated murder, even if we theoretically agree that it's more than simply the sum of the parts. Um, that uh, seems to be a nice segue into a question posed by Gideon Yaffe. And um, Gideon, I don't know if you want to turn your, uh, ask the question yourself. Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, and if you could turn up your volume maybe a little bit. Um, Let's see. I'm still having trouble hearing, in which case I can definitely ask the question on your behalf, unless others can hear. Um, I'm still having trouble hearing, but if, if others can. I'm sorry. I... Oh, actually, that's, I think that works. Does that work for everybody? Okay, okay great. Um, yeah, so, um... Well, what I wanted to ask you is this. I, I, I'm worried that my question is sort of too specific to the... Uh, I think there, you still, we still may have a volume issue. I apologize. I, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, why don't you just ask the question? Okay. All right. And let me know if I, if I butcher it. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's actually good if, if you're close in. Um, so uh, so I, I'll just read it verbatim in the elaboration. I have a question for all about the possibility of reform of felony murder, not through abolition, but through the creation of new homicide categories. And then the, uh, to elaborate, I think for killings like Floyd's, part of the reason the prosecutors choose felony murder is that the standard culpability categories don't seem to capture what's so bad about it. So how about adding a category that does? And I assume meaning possibly lower than first degree, than, than what is equivalent to first degree premeditated. Um, thoughts? And first of all, Gideon, let me know if I butchered that, um, and, and uh, thoughts from the group. I, I had a question, I guess I was envisioning, I thought it was a really interesting question. I don't understand what the new category would be. I sort of more th thought that the statutory answer would sort of be an enhancement. Like to me, what's so um, um, awful um, uh, uh, about the George Floyd killing or, 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 or similar killings is the police are supposed to protect us, sort of what it means for the community if the person, we're, the organization, the entity we're supposed to call for help is actually an organization we're terrified to call for help. Um, and, and, and so it is this sort of, you know, in the same way that parents get held responsible for, um, for not taking care of their kids in a way that a stranger isn't asked to, to take care of the kid. You know, is there some greater, you had a duty and you failed in that. Um, um, strikes me as a really interesting way of thinking about it, although I still think there should be a mental state attached to it, but I didn't understand 
and it may be the lack of imagination, what a separate homicide category would be. Can I, Andrea, can I step in on that? Just, yes, sorry, I think, I, I think I've, good, sorry about my technical problem. I, sure. I, I guess, I mean, this is actually very closely related to your, to what you were just saying, Laura, it's just that the thought looking at, looking at the homo, looking at the, the George Floyd video, that part of what's so horrifying and chilling about it, I think, is that these guys don't seem to be, or at least Chauvin, doesn't seem to be consciously aware of high probabilities that he's gonna kill this guy. He rather seems to be clothing himself in the job. So his view is, I'm the expert here. I know how to do all this. I don't need to roll him on his back. I don't need to listen to the people. I don't need to listen to him saying I can't breathe. I don't need to listen, need to, need to, listen to the crowd saying he's gonna die. You know, None of that matters, why? Because I'm the cop here, I'm the one, I'm the authority. And that, that this looks to me like recklessness as a category does very poorly in capturing people who are in this kind of mental state because it rests on this idea of, high, of awareness of risk. And these seem to be people who aren't aware of risks, but there's something horrible about the fact that they're, that they're blind to these risks. And so, so exactly what the boundaries of this culpability of this form of homicide would be, exactly how to specify what that mental state is, I think is a very hard problem, both in legislative drafting and also in moral philosophy. But that's, I think, what drives prosecutors to look for some other category here, because you can't charge this as a negligent homicide. I mean, that's just ridiculous. But well, it also seems like... To, it well, you could. It's just that the penalty is very, of, very... If you stipulate that he was unaware of the risk, right, and under conventional categories, you have recklessness or negligence to go to, right? So what you might be grasping toward is that the reasons why he was ignorant or unaware of any risk, if you stipulate that he wasn't unaware of a risk, are particularly egregious or heinous or bad or some such thing. So maybe you're trying to cast about for a category somewhere between negligent homicide and reckless homicide. That's, I think, exactly what I'm thinking. Although I don't know whether it belongs between reckless. Maybe it belongs up to depraved heart or higher than depraved heart reckless homicide. I don't know. You know, but there's, so you could think of this as a category of negligent homicide if you want it. It's just that then we have to start thinking about penalties for negligent homicide that look like they're going to be deeply inappropriate for paradigm negligent homicides. Yeah, I don't know. Giora? I think one of the, the topics, that, the themes that run throughout this, uh, many of the papers is this idea of culpability consisting of some, some measure of insufficient concern for others and, uh, you know, for Kim, insufficient concern is only plays a role in recklessness. For others, insufficient concern plays a role in, in uh, you know, denominating a crime as a negligent homicide. And you can always look at the underlying reasons why somebody is unaware of a risk. And if the, those reasons are bad enough and, and it's on a scale, then you've got, you know, you've got a problem of where you draw the line using statutory language to cut that scale. Is, um, would love to hear Giora's thoughts and also is, is there anywhere else in law where we see that sort of extreme negligence or um, something more than gross criminal negligence where we, we look at the purpose underlying the failure to be aware of, subjectively aware of risk and, uh, and deem it more morally culpable and punish it more? Or is this really something have we come up with a fifth category that the model penal code drafters haven't? So um, uh, I'll I'll just intervene here. I'm not sure that um, that that uh, that I've got a good answer for um, Andrea's uh, uh, question, um, uh, but I, I will point out it's sort of an advertisement for for my for my collaborator. So. Um, uh, so Echo Yanka uh, later in the conference is is going to be uh, presenting an argument for a conception of of reckless racism, and so this is um, uh, not recklessness with respect to the risk of death, but um, in, in his case, it's it's uh, recklessness with respect to the role of racism in distorting one's perceptions and, and purposes so that 
it's uh, someone who, who's maybe not not fully aware of uh, of um, uh, the, the role that um, that racism is playing, but but they should be. Um, ordinarily, yeah, the model penal code distinguishes be, be, between uh, situations, as Steve points out, where um, uh, you know we are aware of risk, and and in um, uh, uh, so um, uh, Kim Frazan's theory of um, uh, you know of, of culpable indifference, it, you have to be aware of, of, of the risk to be culpably uh, indifferent. Um, uh, whereas you know negligence, of course, is where where you should be aware of the risk and aren't. And and you know felony murder situations sometimes do pose this sort of a problem, as I as I wrote about in in my paper, the the culpability of felony murder. That is sometimes people you know they sort of they plan a crime. They, you know, they 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 have a gun. Um, they feel like they're in control of the situation, and they're not actually, um, uh, you know, fully adverting to risks because their, you know, their their thinking is is distorted. So this is, you know, this is problematic. Does it, to answer Laura's question, you know, justify going all the way to first degree murder and you know life without parole? No. Um, but you know, actually don't think that murder generally should be punishable by life without parole. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, the enhancement for, um, you know, for, for the felony, independent felonies motive, you know, probably shouldn't be all the way to, uh, you know, to murder even a lesser form of murder. Um, you know, the, the, the difficulty is, is that I think, you know, critiques of felony murder um, have, hijacked it from this sort of, of proportionality analysis into an argument for supporting a one-dimensional, purely, you know, cognitive account of culpability, as if, you know, that rather than, than proportional punishment is the goal. It's sort of winning on, you know, what's the, the right theory of, um, of culpability. Obviously, we shouldn't retain felony murder just so you know, just so that Ken Simons and I, um, you know, can can feel you know gratified that this sort of two-dimensional account of culpability is is um, uh, is, is being vindicated because it won't be if we retain felony murder. You know, it's going to be um, because prosecutors want to win and want to make it easy in exactly the ways that that Judge Rakoff has, um, you know. Uh, has explained. I have, I have a, minutes I, left. Stephen, did you want? I, yeah, I have a quick proposal for Gideon. So, Gideon, we come up with a new crime. We call it depraved mind negligent homicide. And this crime is defined as causing the death of another human being when you're unaware that what you're doing would create any risk of causing death. And the reason you're unaware that you're creating any risk is as a result of extreme indifference to the value of human life. So in other words, you take depraved heart murder and you move it down into the, uh, to bump up the negligence category. Laura and Gideon, are you satisfied? <laughs> uh, well, perhaps, it, perhaps I'm too sort of grounded in the example that was given, so possible. Um, but but I was sort of thinking to me again that's that's sort of like a it's like an evidentiary problem right I mean in that example everyone's saying like that looks really dangerous he could die right and the reason why in that scenario we would be worried about um, the uh, officer being found not guilty is because not just the officer has a cloak of like, no, no, I know best, but that the jury's like, well, I don't know, being a police officer, that's like a totally different experience in life. And even though everyone's saying like, you're killing him, somehow he doesn't have to hear that. Like the ability to say he wasn't subjectively aware when everyone's screaming it, I'm not sure we need another category for that. We need some kind of evidentiary, you know, sort of like, um, um, uh, uh, like rape victim, rape shield law, right? Like the police shield law, you don't get to talk about police something as if being a police officer 
in these circumstances is really different, gives you a different sense of awareness or, or, or ability to value human life. Um, so I hate to cut this off, um, but we are over time. And so um, I just want to thank our panelists and commentators and those who had questions. There are a couple we didn't get to. Um, so uh, I'll hand it back over to Michael and um, I think at least, and uh, look forward to hearing Professor Yanka's uh, talk later in the day. Great, so we are gonna take a, at this point, nine minute break and we'll be back with the next panel. So thank you. <laughs>